So, uh, hello everyone. Um, I'm Martha Kichin, I'm from Budapest, and I previously, so I'm mainly I'm a, a visual artist, and I studied at the Hungarian University of Fine Arts, and now I'm studying at Moholy Nagy University of Art and Design, doing my doctorate there, which is a doctorate in practice um, for multimedia artists. Uh, but um, my interest is in immersive media, and I'm also increasingly focusing on media archaeology and how that can be effective. And um, this is a topic that I have been interested in for nearly like 10 years, and I've always wanted to give a presentation about it somehow. Uh, and this kind of also inspired me to then later uh, focus on my bridge and his even earlier experiments. And um, so the film I will focus on is uh, Bodhi Gabor's Narcissus and Psyche. And this is a film made in 1980, and it is a quite unique example of early postmodern film in uh, Soviet era Hungary. And, um, and it is interesting because this was the director's second feature film, and uh, it was extremely unique that after, um, after a s making, yeah, yeah. Uh, so his, his first film was um, his diploma film at the university and he managed to make that uh, produced by the Balaj Bila studio and however it's quite, and although that was uh, sent to festivals internationally and acknowledged um, still it's kind of questionable how did he then get funding to, ha to make a colour feature film which is extremely experimental um, and using Western actors and unfortunately uh, well he died five years later before he turned 40 under mysterious circumstances and we don't know if he committed suicide or if he was murdered and later on it turned out that he was a secret agent for the Hungarian government um, and maybe even Eastern Germany as well and so it is speculated that probably he got this amazing opportunity because of collaborating with the government. But then it's a very interesting uh, situation that he used this opportunity to create such an experimental film, which is uh, really breaking the boundaries of not, on, of not only Soviet era Hungarian film, but also of feature film in general. And um, um, so he he called it new narrativity, which is that he um, tried, this is, it's, a very, it's an epic film covering a century and a half of culture and ideology with never aging actors or characters. Um, so it's quite surrealistic and very playful visually. And he was a video artist as well and was very active in the international video art scene. So you can tell that he is using a lot of his creative um, freedom from his video art in this uh, feature film. And it's quite debatable whether or not, or how one wants to um, acknowledge this film, because some people think it's a masterpiece of Hungarian film, some people think it's really hard to watch and really doesn't work. And to be honest, I do see a lot of problem with the narrative, with the editing, with the with, with how we can, how hard it can be to connect empathetically with the characters. And that is why, um, but it was still very uh, enchanting for me. And I think it's because of these very, this very strong visual aspects of it. And um, so I'm kind of revisiting this as a series of video art. And I'm gonna focus on a few scenes which have got very striking imagery with a lot of uh, cultural connections to fine art, which I will show soon. Um, and, yeah. Uh, so, uh, it's interesting that he, um, his work is very image-based, and it's very much, many parallels can be drawn with Peter Greenaway and his uh, pictorial cinema, because he was, you know, Peter Greenaway is a big advocate against uh, script-based films. 
And similarly, Bodhi Gabor is extremely, um, has very poignant uh, visual language. And this is, these few slides will be about his first film. And it's interesting that even this film has got lots of parallels with Peter Greenaway's first film. If I remember correctly, this is his first feature film, um, similarly. And um, it's interesting that they are both, both Greenaway and Bordy are very interested in uh, history, in, in optic, optical equipment, and um, how that can be depicted on the film plane. And um, it's even more um, I don't know, bizarre parallel that they both, in both of their first feature films, they're using these grid structures, which they impose onto the film plane. And um, we're on the, in the case of American Torso, it's uh, because this is uh, featuring three Hungarian revolutionaries who uh, escaped Hungary after the unsuccessful 19th century revolution and went to America, and they took part in the American Civil War. And one of them is a cartographer who's using a rangefinder. And often we can see through the eyes of the cartographer or within, with his equipment. Um, and there are often these grids on the images and we can see it's a kind of POV of, of um, the user of the equipment. Uh, I'm sorry because there are different ratios of, diff of the images I've brought from American Torso because there is very little footage of this on good in good quality on the internet. So, but it, it's 4.3, um, 4 by 3 otherwise. And then also simil similarly in the draftman's contract, there's also this grid structure with which, which is often um, aligned with the camera. So we can see uh, the scenery through this and the characters through it. Um, but here, um, I kind of, yeah, uh, I'd like to argue in two ways that um, Bodhi is more effective in his use of, um, of technology in his filmmaking because uh, Greenaway simply shows how uh, this drawer in the um, 18th century sees the world, but Bodhi actually uses um, this technology in the actual material of his film, in the actual visual language, um, by, as you can see, adding these effects onto the various scenes. Um, and obviously, Greenaway is just showing us drawings. The film itself is not a drawing. Um, and another interesting thing um, in which this is more effective and, and a more of a, I don't know, full uh, intermedial um, act uh, it, by Bordi is that the whole film is made as if it is a 19th century daguerreotype, uh, which is, I think, a very interesting thing. And we were saying yesterday about how there are some digital videos which try to look like analog film. And this is a kind of step back in time that analog film is trying to look like daguerreotypes. And it's trying to look like film from an era when film hardly existed or didn't exist. Um, so yeah, this is just like a, um, an, uh, an introductory <laughs> parallel. Um, but back to narcissists and psyche, there, are, there will be, um, I will later talk about more parallels with Greenaway. But first, let me just show a few of these um, a bit more random parallels that I found with artworks um, and scenes in the film. And what I think is interesting and very effective and strong in Bordi's work is how it's not only um, reconstructing the scene which was painted, but it's actually recreating the whole atmosphere of that painting and recreating even the painterly gestures with filmic analog methods. Um, this is a simple example, but then it will get more and more um, complex. Uh, and he, uh, I mean, I don't even have um, precise evidence that he works based on these works, but you will see that there are really strong parallels, and I think it's still interesting to talk about it, whether or not this was the case. Um, and again, it's an even more interesting thing to consider whether Greenaway ever saw Wardy's films. Um, and so these are 
so the second half of the film is set in the end of the 19th century, and these artworks are from the end of the 19th century. So um, I am debating to say that he, he uh, tried to focus on artworks to not only understand, um, I don't know, how the clo what the clothing was like in that era, but also to understand the whole uh, philosophy and the whole emotional um, mood of that era. And in the and there is um, there are actually kind of some interesting parallels with the film in the previous presentation um, regarding the narrative, um, but here it's there is a focus on um, on an unfulfilled love, and one of the main characters is this woman who is um, well lives a very chaotic life, but uh, is very emancipated really in that era, and. Um, Munch's uh, painting is kind of showing this problematic of the 19th century, end of the 19th century, a bit of a femme fatale kind of type of this um, unattainable or un, um, of this connection, a new freak sexual connection to women, but yet again there might be this um, inability to fulfill, to gain emotional fulfillment in connection with these. Uh, women and, and similarly in both images we see that they are naked and we see them in a very uh, sensual way which would be very unusual in that era but yet there is this strange alienated sense in which um, they are depicted that they are in this darkness that they um, that there is a true connection to them but also they don't seem to be able to connect to us because we can't see their hands their arms they aren't um, reaching out towards us. Um, and another, so this is a more, um, more of a kind of, I don't know, effective modality maybe in this, I mean, in which the whole technological opportunities of film are being used um, and to, to recreate this vision. And, um, so because in this film, this is dealing with um, the development of uh, the ideal of a nation state. And we can see in this dreamlike scene as if Hungarians are joining together and starting to march and sing, maybe as a start of a revolution. But as it is so dreamy, we can never truly be sure if this is fact or fiction that we can see here. And um, this really interesting blurry effect has been created purely an in an analog way by, with filters and by um, uh, like distorting these lenses in front of the camera and, um, or even destroying them. And it's interesting that there, this isn't a narrative scene because, and also in the whole film, there is a lot of narrative jumps. There are lots of play with time, with uh, speeding up. Um, the footage and here it kind of accelerates and then stops and starts again so it kind of never gets fulfilled as um, 19th century Hungarian revolutions didn't get fulfilled either and uh, here we can see this painting by Simon Holoshi, a Hungarian painter of that era and he uh, this is um, a painting entitled uh, Rakoci March which I, some of you are probably familiar that this is a very famous kind of unofficial Hungarian hymn. Um, and, and he wanted to make this as a huge, uh, important um, image about Hungarian national emotions after the unsuccessful revolution, how, because he was very nationalistic um, during the monarchy, Austro-Hungarian monarchy. But he never managed to fulfill this aim of doing this painting, and he created many different variations, and they're never fully finished. So this is, again, another interesting parallel of how the scene stops and starts, and also he hasn't ever, also, uh, Holoshi never finished the painting. And a uh, parallel why we would think that this is a dreamlike um, scene in which it's just someone's daydream of this fulfillment and not reality is that because of the blurriness in both images we can never see the location so it's not placed properly in time or place but it's just this um, mirage of Hungarian populist um, 
activating themselves. And, um, and then another scene, which, sorry, yeah, there are a parallel between the two because we can see these people walking towards the picture frame, the picture plane or the film plane. And um, so that's quite an uncanny way of nearly breaking the fourth wall. And um, even though this is, we can see in both images, it's very warm and therefore we can feel that it's positive. Um, and also it's interesting that there is a sonic aspect to this as well, because in the film scene, there is singing, um, which is obviously another symbol of a group uniting. And this, the title of the painting is a song. So it's an interesting um, connection. So, and then in stark contrast, this blue, cold uh, scene uh, shows workers crippled by the uh, Industrial Revolution. And it's because uh, it's showing this journey of, the main, of the, one of the protagonists of how their enlightened, enlightened and their nationalistic ideals get broken by industrialization. And here they face, and because they are, they are aristocratic, so now they are, here they are facing the horrors of um, industrialization and also of the kind of working class masses of society. Um, and so here I found this parallel with uh, a painting by Edward Munch. And again, we see them coming towards us and we can, I think we can see this horror of uh, a slightly upper class intellectual person meeting all these people because um, there is no empathy. Actually, in this image, there is horror, and there is horror for these, their hardships, but there is an empathy because we don't see them as individuals. We don't see them close up, and they're just more specters. Um, and again, it's uncanny that they are coming towards us, and obviously, when it's a, a scene of negative emotions, then it becomes uncanny when they are coming towards us instead of um, joyfulness of a group uniting. Um, and then... Yeah, and then um, reaching slowly towards the end of the presentation and then going back to Greenaway soon, uh, there, the next scene straight away after this one with the workers uh, comes this more abstract scene with uh, the protagonist talking about um, his delusional ideology of race, racial clean, cleansing. Um, and how one can measure the human body and, and things like that. But again, we see that this is a lot more of an effective way of um, representing Mybridge's work in film than just, re than just placing a photograph of, of his in the scene or recreating the whole scene. Because here we don't actually see a photograph and we don't see a photograph made, we just see the aesthetics of Mybridge's studio. And therefore, we understand more of the whole concept which was um, behind Mybridge's pictures of the aim to understand the human body as a machine, um, to be able to rationalize it with, with grids and time. Um, yeah, and, uh, and again, you know, it's this uh, neutral depiction of the naked human body which uh, is again a kind of medical, rationalistic uh, way to connect to, to um, yeah, way to connect. In contrast to uh, more intimate scenes in the beginning of the film with sexual acts, um, and then here is uh, the parallel I draw, I drew um, between Peter Greenaway's Z and Two Noughts, and here we similarly seen a studio-like reenaction of Mybridge's uh, images. And, um, and it's interesting because both films um, work a lot with time and the, the passing of time, and they have a lot of fast motion scenes inside it, which mainly um, are used to uh, differentiate from different dramatical narrative scenes. And, um, with Narcissus and Psyche, we see images of clouds going in fast motion to depict the passing of time throughout decades. Uh, while with Z and Two Knots, we see fast forward um, footage of animals decaying in front of a grid structure. 
And the difference between um, this Mybridge-like studio presence in the films uh, is that with Narcissus and Psyche, this isn't a part of the narrative um, in a very straightforward way, as in that these are not characters from the film. There is no narrative motivation for these people to be in this situation. This is more just a kind of free uh, depiction and more of an effective way of presenting the protagonist's idealization, um, I, I, uh, concept of racial um, measurements. Uh, while in As Identity Notes, this is actually, these are two protagonists who are actually choosing to be in this situation and they have their own motivations to do so. Um, so, yeah, all in all, uh, I think it's very interesting to see how Bordi Gabor's postmodern um, film methods kind of preceded what Greenaway did by five or seven years even, um, even though obviously there isn't perfectly uh, equal what they're doing, but I think there are still lots of interesting parallels. And um, even though it's not a, you know, the most successful postmodern Hungarian film, I think it is still a very, very brave uh, example of wh how one can take uh, experimental film sensibility into feature filmmaking. Yeah, so thank you.